Uh, welcome to the uh, session of the uh, Radiology Research Alliance um, Research Boot Camp. Our first speaker will be Bill Offerman. Okay, thank you, everyone. Is there a way we can go and show you a few bears? So we can dim the lights just a little bit. Do we have that power up here? Don't know? Okay. Okay, so actually uh, the first talk is by uh, Dr. King, uh, Kevin King, and he cannot be here today, so I am presenting these slides on his behalf. You've got to be kidding me. I uploaded them. Oh, boy. Okay. Kevin King. Ah, this one. Okay. <laughs> I got scared there for a minute. Okay. So, um... For our REACH Research Bootcamp, this is a, uh, a series of talks intended primarily geared towards new researchers, uh, although everyone is, of course, welcome. And so it's the, the topics will be geared towards newer researchers, and the topics will include uh, the initial part of experimental planning and design, the first talk here by Kevin that I will be presenting for him, my talk on statistical analysis, and followed by a last talk by Andy Rosenkrantz about publishing the paper. Okay, so. Well, first of all, is you know why do we do research? Um, and so basically, um, you know, it's a way of like a, you know just like having established guidelines that are fact-based. I'm sure that uh, you know that there's a very trend now towards a more greater evidence-based medicine rather than eminence-based medicine, which was historically what a lot of medicine was based on, and that's done through research. Um, and so basically, you know that there's specific questions that you might may pop up like along your uh, your work day and the work you do. And uh, Kevin seems to be fond of the two we have here. You know, will night float systems make uh, residents call better? And uh, assessing the hippocampus for mesiotemporal mesiotemporal sclerosis. Um, and so um, basically, um, research uh, is. Uh, a lot of the best research occurs through things you encounter in your daily workflow. You know, so things that you work say, wow, I always had a question about this and I've noticed this. Those are the types of things will often make really good research projects since they're things you encounter every day and are probably very familiar with since they're part of your normal work day. Um, and so uh, it's really important when you're starting your research to have this precise a formulation of the question you want to answer before you start doing your research. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later in my talk when I talk about hypotheses. Um, and uh, so the examples you have here, <laughs> you know, the observations, I hate staying up at night. Um, and mm -hmm. the, uh, the question is, uh, you know, will night float um, reduce the miss rate if somebody only has to be open awake for 12 hours rather than 24 hours? And he has another example here about, uh, you know, like the hippocampal gyrus, you know, like, gosh, is that really mesiotemporal sclerosis? Are they asymmetric enough? And what is the normal variation seen in the, mesio in the uh, hippocampi? And so just beyond that, I think it's, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, beyond just having a question you want to ask, okay, the question should be as specific as possible, and you'll want to ask um, as many questions as you think appropriate. So basically what the question you ask will dictate how you design your experiment and the data you collect. And if you don't ask the correct question or questions, you may not have enough data at the end of your experiment to really answer the question that you, after analyzing the data, realize you really should have asked if that makes any, question, make, makes any sense at all. Um, and two, uh, a hypothesis, the, the question should be phrased in a way that can be mathematically tested. Um, and so, um, you know, he, uh, some of the things here, so you start with your question, I'd actually put it, you know, you've got your question first, like, uh, you know, um, let, let's say, you know, uh, what is the, uh, uh, does, does the certain medic, if we uh, use a certain imaging test, is it more sensitive for detecting cancer? That's your question. Then you have your hypothesis, which is often stated in a way, or should be in a way that's mathematically testable. You know, one such way of doing that is like, you know, is the detection, uh, you know, is the, uh, uh, detection rate using LROC anal using ROC analysis for this technique greater than existing techniques. Okay, that would be something that's mathematically testable. And the aim is basically how you're going to go about proving or testing your hypothesis. You know, I, my goal is to test this hypothesis by doing X, Y, and Z. And so a very important part, um, once you've kind of gotten something that you're interested in and, you know, looking into, um, a very important thing to do first is to check the literature. And this might almost seem like a bit of a joke, but seriously, you can save a lot of time if you recognize that somebody's already published it before, before you start going and doing a lot of work on your own. Um, 
And uh, not only that, but once you, you know, once you've been doing your literature review and you've discovered nobody's done it, that literature review you've just done actually forms a very nice basis for the introduction for your paper, right? And so you kind of, you can do a lot of things in, oops, you can do a lot of things in tandem here. So when you're doing your literature review to see if anyone's done it, if you collect some of those references, maybe write it up a little bit, you basically got the introduction, you've got the introduction for your paper, okay? And so you've kind of killed like three birds with one stone, really. Um, and some of the references he suggests are textbooks are a really nice um, initial source for a big picture overview. Like uh, I'd say especially, you know, like for big picture concepts, like for statistics and things like that. Um, I, I wouldn't know what the big picture is. Textbooks are great for that. But in terms of what's the latest in the field, the next step towards that would be your review articles um, followed by peer-reviewed publications where you'd probably get the latest in terms of evidence for a, a particular topic. Now, I thought this was kind of neat. He includes um, uh, different levels of evidence. And so, um, you know, your level seven evidence is basically what I'd classify as your eminence-based medicine, um, where, you know, you're attending, uh, you know, the, or chair or what have you, slams their fist on the lectern and says, this is the answer, and that is the answer, right? That's how medicine was practiced for a very long time, uh, less so today, where we have uh, use experimental studies to validate you know, our statements about what is or is not correct. And as you'll see here, they're varying, you know, consider classified as varying levels of evidence, starting with, you know, descriptive uh, qualitative studies, which could be, you know, I mean, these would kind of be like case reports or case series, uh, followed by um, uh, some of your meta-analyses of those, um, and then uh, case control or cohort studies, um, ran uh, ex uh, ex uh, clinical trials without randomization. Uh, your randomized clinical control trials are probably your single best experiment you can conduct. That having been said, <laughs> An uh, ensemble of clinical trials is the best level of evidence you can have, okay? And so these are different levels of evidence for uh, um, proving something uh, in medicine. And so if you're starting off, you're probably going to be starting off a little bit lower down here, but, you know, starting with your, your smaller single-center trials before you go to large multi-center trials. Um, and here's some examples he included of, you know, kind of like consent, like uh, expert panel dis uh, decisions on uh, use of MR imaging, followed by... Um, a, uh, a clinical trial uh, examining the use of MRI on patients with uh, medical devices such as pacemakers. Um, and, you know, using the, in this trial, they basically found that there are no adverse outcomes in a certain set of given conditions. Uh, you know, kind of taking what was initially, you know, more uh, eminence-based medicine consensus-based decisions to something that's been verified by a clinical trial, okay? Um, and so basically... Um, uh, this, I, the slide, this slide here is just basically saying that when you're getting started, okay, now it's really getting hard sometimes getting started on a project, where do I start with the darn thing? Well, one is you can ask the people around you. I'm sure everybody has people, you know, more senior and who've done similar things in their institutions who can help them out. That's always a great place to start. Another way is to see what other people have done in the literature. Um, I mean, if somebody has done, uh, my research is on medical image perception, and if I want to know how to do a perceptual study, um, I basically have seen what people have done before and, and, you know, to a certain extent try to replicate the conditions um, and methodologies that they've used um, while answering my, my own question. So basically use pre-existing um, uh, ver validated tech, uh, methods so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to do something. Okay? And, uh, you know, so it's a great way not just to get your ideas, um, building on what other people have done, uh, but to also get your techniques. And I'm sure you've heard the, you know, the Isaac Newton quote, if I see far, it's because I've st I can stand on the shoulders of giants. It makes a lot easier when you stand on the shoulders of giants than to try to jump up and take a look for yourself sometimes. Um, and so it talks a little bit here about avoiding traps. And uh, these are many. <laughs> and they happen in very, you know, unexpected places at times. And so the way I'd kind of think about this is when you're thinking about your experiment and the data you want to collect, um, when you have a good understanding of the data you're collecting, you know, you, you look at the data set, try to have an understanding of what the data points mean, where it comes from, what happens along the process. You can identify some areas where problems might occur. I remember once um, I was doing a study on uh, looking at turnaround times. And so, you know, we constructed our... Uh, our experiment and, you know, said how we're going to collect our data, randomized the studies, collected our data, analyzed it, and we realized there was a weird inconsistency right about the middle of our data set, and that actually correlated with a place where we changed workflow in our department, so the turnaround times completely changed. Um, and so, you know, if, if you kind of, sometimes it's unavoidable, 
Um, but if you really sit down and think, okay, what could really botch this experiment? You know, did any, like, and you know, if you're looking at something over a period of time, did anything change during that period of time that could potentially adversely affect your experiment? You know, um, so the more you think about this in advance, the let lower the probability that something is going to happen that's going to make your life difficult later on. Of course, sometimes that's unavoidable, uh, no matter how hard you try. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, sometimes you can uh, correct for some of these um, uh, anomalies later on, but it's much easier when you're designing your experiment to account for them than to deal with them uh, retroactively. And uh, yeah, w a few of these ways that he mentioned are you might want to uh, change your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, and one other thing that I would say is that's very important is that um, when you're collecting data, um, it's probably better to err a little bit on collecting more data than less data. Like, oh, we may or may not need this. I think we might. I think we might. If you're, if you're that on the fence, collect the data point. Um, because it's, uh, especially if you're working with human subjects, once they leave the room, good luck getting them to you know, give you more data points later on. So um, you don't want to uh, belabor the point, and uh, especially if you're working with human subjects, to gather too many data points that would either lead to um, subjects not wanting to participate or discomfort. Um, but if you're doing like a chart review, it's probably got better to gather a few more data points than a few too little, because um, that can make things more difficult later on. And um, yes, yeah, so we talked a little bit here about your types of, uh, of variables. And this is, uh, this is actually, I'd say, very important for the an analysis phase. And um, when you're um, collecting your data, you know, it's really helpful to know, are you working with, uh, he talks here about your um, ordinal data, and that's uh, discrete data points that can be ordered, like one, two, three, four. There's an intrinsic ordering that can be imposed on you know, a, a set of numbers. Um, and uh, so that would be one type of data. Another type of data would be called categorical data. That's data that's it's discrete, and, uh, you know, uh, but it doesn't actually, there's no way of ordering it, like red, green, and blue. It's really hard to you know, put an ordering to red, green, and blue, unless you do it by you know, the wavelength. But, you know, uh, but there's some other things that would be more difficult to order rather than red, green, and blue. And then, of course, we have um, your continuous data, which you know cannot, which are basically can be modeled by you know like a discrete bucket. It would be more uh, uh, modeled by a uh, um, a natural number or a whole number, um, or decimal points, so to speak. And so, um, sometimes uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the statistics later. But there are a lot of resources out there that are helpful. And uh, one of the things he mentions is that the uh, RRA and Razor had a, uh, a series of uh, statistical webinars that were presented over the past year. Two more are still yet to be presented. Um, and they are available on the AUR website on a variety of statistical topics, um, should, and they're available for everyone to view. So uh, that, that's a one resource that's available. Um, and of course, he uh, talks a little bit about uh, you know, like your literature search. You can see how other people have done the, the analyses before. He mentions one uh, piece of software here, R. There are various other pieces of software out there, out there. I actually think the easiest piece of software to use for statistics is probably Excel. It actually is really easy for simple stuff. Um, and there are several other packages out there that are useful for more complicated data analysis. And uh, talks a little bit about the statistical plan. I'll talk about this a bit more later. And uh, so he actually talks about working towards a manuscript while you're doing your research. And I actually think this is probably a good idea. So if things are evolutionary, right? You don't, just, you don't just sit down, have a brilliant idea, and write it up, and, and you're done, right? It, it goes through many iterations. And sometimes, like I said, when you're doing your literature search, um, Okay, you've got all your papers, you order them, you can write it up to clear things in your own head partially, but then you've got the introduction for your paper. Then when you're deciding how you want to do your experiment, you can basically write the method section right there. And while you're going through that mental process of putting everything together, you, you, it, things gel in your mind, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I can't do this because of that. You know, and you start realizing things while you're writing that you would not have realized if you hadn't been putting it together in writing. So this is actually a very helpful way at times um, to be able to uh, actually have the uh, topic makes sense to yourself and get to a place that you wouldn't have gotten to unless you'd started writing. I remember, uh, I thought it was such great advice, you know, um, one of my uh, high school um, uh, teachers always said, you know, writing is the process by which you get to a point that you wouldn't have gotten to if you hadn't been writing, right? And I actually find that for these research papers as well. If you start writing beforehand, it helps you think it through, and you actually have a much more developed and mature idea than had you not written it up. And then, of course, when you actually want to write up your results later, it makes it a lot easier. So you've done most of the work already. 
Um, and uh, this one here is basically, um, he talks a little bit about the relative um, value, you might say, of different types of academic um, uh, materials and currency. That, you know, abstracts are great, you get to present them, you get to meet people, but in terms of how valuable they are in your CV for promotion, um, papers are, uh, are in uh, publications in refereed journals are considered to be more highly valued. So just not to say that you don't ever want to, you know, give an abstract or give a talk, but just to recognize that papers are very valuable and, and you should focus, you should have that being, a, you know, a, a large part of your uh, CV. Uh, and that was the end of Dr. King's talk. And I believe we're having questions at the end. So next talk, we'll go to mine. Okay, where am I? Nope, I'm hitting escape, nothing's happening. So we're about three, begin. Back, God, there we go. Oh, you have to select the slot, that was it, okay. I didn't know you had to select, thank you. All right, now we go on to my talk. I'll be talking about uh, analyzing the data, pearls and pitfalls. No disclosures. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, some key principles of statistics and research common sources of error for uh, kind of like your newer investigators and ways to avoid these errors. Now, one definition of statistics is it's the uh, way that deals with collection classification analysis of numerical d uh, data and facts in a way to impose some type of order that may not otherwise be apparent. Um, you know, uh, so if, if something's really obvious, you know, like if someone says, what color is, is this? And you say, you know, like this light, and you say it's red, and I say, what's your p-value? You'll look at me like I'm crazy. But that, that just goes to show that you use statistics for things that are not necessarily apparent, and that's why you use them to help impose order on something that would otherwise seem disorganized. And so why does statistics matter? Well, it's a very useful way of summarizing data and making inferential statements. Uh, appropriate application can lead to ways of highlighting data. An incorrect application can be confusing at uh, best, misleading at worst. And I rem you know, I'm sure you've all heard the quote, you know, there are three types of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, I disagree with that. Statistics don't lie, but they can be misleading if incorrectly applied. And we're going to hopefully discuss some ways of avoiding that today. So when, you, when I think of the statistical evaluation of data, it's basically the entire experimental process, right? You have a question, you develop a hypothesis, you design your experiment to collect that, and you're intimately involved with the statistics you'll use and apply. You'll examine the data, select an appropriate statistics, analyze the data, and make inferential statements. Well, um, we, we talked about these two that I grayed out here before, so we're going to focus uh, on uh, the ones that are uh, highlighted. And these are, I'd say, some of the pitfalls for new investigators. Now, you know, it, once you've uh, done this enough time, you know, once you've become more, uh, done more, uh, have more experience in research, you're less likely to make some of the earlier mistakes, but I've seen several people make these. Um, and so I think it's really important uh, to discuss these. And I will say there are lots of papers out there about errors in, in uh, statistics. Um, I think a lot of them are at a higher level where they really focus on smaller, you know, smaller uh, ideas. So I'm focusing on some really basic mistakes that I've seen people make when they're earlier on in their careers. Um, but first I'll talk a little bit about hypotheses. Now, um, a hypothesis is a basically a proposed explanation for a phenomenon. Um, and the key aspect of good statistics is having a good hypothesis, okay? Um, they're often paired with their logical complement, like the null hypothesis is the default, the alternative, it's logical complement or opposite. Um, so examples of hypotheses would be the medication decreases tumor size and the medication does not decrease tumor size. Now, pitfall one is no hypothesis, okay? Um, and I, I'm, so basically, before you really start gathering data, um, and, and this is like for preliminary data, you're not gonna publish a paper without a hypothesis really, but when you're gathering preliminary data, you know, have a hypothesis you're looking for and have a good idea of what you're looking for. Otherwise, you could spend a good bit of time going through data without really getting the data you need. Um, and so I'm kind of curious, can I show up hands? Who here has seen somebody, you know, gathering data and then you talk to them about it and they have no hypothesis they're testing? Can you raise your hand? I know I've seen that. Okay, so there are a few people raising their hands and it won't get to a point of publication like that, but you can easily spin your wheels for a few days or maybe a week, you know, a few weeks gathering data without a clearly formulated hypothesis and then realize that, wow, you know, I was asking, I didn't, I was, I was not collecting the correct data. 
And that can be really painful because then you have to go back and analyze your data set again. Or if you've collect, done an experiment, you know, your experiment might not, you might be able to use the data if you didn't collect everything you need. Um, so uh, the solution to this is to try to formulate as clear a null hypothesis as you are able at your stage in the study, um, recognizing that, you know, especially if it's pilots, a pilot study, you will um, refine that hypothesis as you move forward, and the hypothesis that you'll test at the end might not be the same one you started with, but having as clear a formulation you can as initially of that hypothesis should really save you a lot of time and effort. Pitfall two, incorrect hypothesis. So th I think this is really important. A hypothesis should address the question of interest and be mathematically testable. Okay, that last part is the key. Be mathematically testable, okay? A clear statement of a mathematically testable hypothesis is critical. Now, um, these hypotheses here, I would say, are poor because they're not implicitly, explicitly mathematically testable, okay? We'll start with this one. Well, what does decrease mean, right? I mean, are we talking about volumetrics, dimensions, uh, SUV values on PET, you know, some other radio tracer, blood flow, and contrast enhancement? Okay, so I would submit that this is a better hypothesis. You know, the tumor size in the experimental group will be equal to the treatment group. Well, they have clearly defined what, you, and then and the alternative is that the tumor size in the experimental group will be uh, less than the treatment group. And as a part of that, I explicitly have a statement for how we're going to measure that. The size is estimated as the average of the maximum length and its perpendicular short axis measurement on axial images. I, I really do encourage people to do this when they're writing their hypotheses because I, I, I've seen people do this. Well, they'll go and they'll collect measurements, and I'm like, okay, well, that's neat. You know, um, you only collected one measurement, long axis. You didn't collect short axis, and then there's this pause, and it's like, oh my god. And then they have to go back and look at all the images again and collect short axis measurements. So, doing this up front, a clear, explicit statement of not just what your hypothesis is and how it's going to be mathematically tested, but the metrics you'll use to measure it, are very important and can save you a lot of time. Okay. Another one, the radio tracer detects cancer, right? Well, how are you gonna test that? I would argue that these are more testable hypotheses, okay? That you actually specify the size limit you have, the sensitivity and specificity. Now, why do you have to have sensitivity and specificity? Because detection, if you're doing, um, you know, if you consider the ROC curve, right? Depending on where you set your, your sensitivity or specificity will change, right? You can detect 100% of five millimeter cancers if you say everything's abnormal, right? So you need to specify these in advance. But I, I will actually say that you could do a step better than this and actually say that how you're going to measure the size. Well, how are you going to measure the size, right? Um, you know, and you that actually, if you explicitly state this, state actually how you're going to like do the PET measurements all up front, then you'll actually be pretty sure you're going to collect all the data you need. Um, and uh, yeah, so an example would be, like I said, you know, you, you do a study, you collect your data on tumor size, and then after collecting it all, you want to do some volumetrics, and then you realize you only got unidimensional measurements. You know, you're, you're kind of going to be in some trouble here. You've got to reanalyze a lot of data. Or if you collect the data on human subjects, you might, you might not be able to gather it. Um, and so uh, another example of incorrect hypothesis here would be, uh, so here's a plot imagined of minimum and maximum, uh, uh, you know, cross-sectional measurements of a tumor. I don't know about you, but I really can't tell much of a difference between the two groups of pluses and, zero and uh, circles. And then the researchers say, well, wow, what if we maybe look at this with results of uh, look at tumor marker effect? But guess what? When they did their, uh, when they did their, um, their uh, chart review, they didn't collect tumor marker information. Now they have to go back and do it again. Who's seen this happen? Just a show of hands. Yeah, oh, look, look at all the people. Okay, so new investigators, look at this. This happens, okay? And it might not sink your ship, but it might be a lot more work. Okay, this might be, for those of you, you know, who, <laughs> who have families, this could be a weekend you could otherwise spend with your family. You spend re-looking re at your data and redoing a chart review. So once again, the solution is that you want to specify your null and alternative hypothesis as clearly as possible in a mathematically testable way, and I like to include exactly the, the measurements I'm going to use to, to measure them, okay? Um, pitfall three would be the incorrect statistic. Now, you should pick the statistic you best want to use to evaluate your data. So let's say that uh, we have an example here of, uh, you know, coronary artery calcification and, uh, and you know, risk of, like, uh, of heart disease, something like that. And this, this is a random plot I generated, okay? So what I've seen some folks do is say, okay, we'll break this into high, middle, and low risk categories. We'll look at the mean and standard deviations. And when we apply a t-test that uh, group two does not differ from group one and group one doesn't differ from group two, but group one differs from group three. Now, what would be a better way to analyze this data? Anybody? Anyone? 
Okay, linear regression, right? It looks like a continuous variable. Why break this up into high, mid, and low class categories? You can just do this as a linear regression um, of, uh, of your uh, risk on the coronary calcium. And so, but, you know, and I think the solution is to, this is where it's kind of a little hard. You, you want to understand your data. You know, what am I looking at? Is this a categorical variable? Is this an ordinal, discrete variable? Is this a continuous variable? Okay, and based on which of those data sets it is, um, and, and you know, are, are there implicit categories here, high, middle, low? Do I need to create them? Can I just do away with them for right now? Maybe include them later? You know, these are all ways that you can actually change the statistics you're going to do and analyze your data in a more appropriate fashion. Um, and so, but like I said, this is basically a part of this is understanding the data set and the physical problem that you're evaluating, okay? I'd say pitfall number four would be incorrect distribution. Um, data distributed in such a way that some statistical tests might not be valid. So uh, I know I was actually, you know, reviewing uh, like a paper a while ago and, you know, um, the researchers, you know, did a paired student's t-test, so you have one distribution, not two, right? It's a paired difference, so you get one distribution. Um, and they applied their t-test and the difference uh, was, uh, had a p-value of very, very low. That sounds fantastic. But what's the problem? Anyone know what the problem is? This data is not normally distributed, right? A t-test assumes that your data is normally distributed to be, to be a valid test. Now, for large data sets, that's valid, but for, you can, for, non, for, for large data sets, the normal uh, assumption actually holds pretty well. For smaller data sets like this one, it might not. So a t-test might not be a valid data, is not a valid test in this instance. There are other tests out there, um, like uh, your Wilcoxon test, I believe, your Wilcoxon tests, I believe, um, which are non-parametric tests, I don't believe require um, a symmetry uh, in your data sets or a normality. I know they don't require normality. Um, but that would be another option, okay? So understanding, you know, what your data looks like and what its assumptions are will, should guide you to the best studies. Um, this is your normal distribution. You know, a lot of um, parametric statistics, the statistics we see a lot, um, the t-test and whatnot, what have you, a lot of regression analysis and ANOVAs actually make some normal assumptions. Um, and another example, I've seen one of these too when I was reviewing a paper, okay? Very similar. What's the problem with this? Paired t-test. Bimodal, that's right. You, so what's probably happening here? They probably have two subpopulations they're analyzing at the same time, right? What they really should do in this case is identify those subpopulations and analyze them separately. You know, I mean, th this, this is actually a good thing, right? You might have just found out something really interesting. You're like, wait a minute, there are two groups here. Nobody knows there are two groups. You might have found something out really neat. So I think this is really important. When you want to know what your data looks like, and I see all these papers published, but people rarely show like a frequency polygon or histogram. You know, the histograms like those bar plots you kind of get, and I, they actually make the data look very squared off and boxy. I'm a big fan of the frequency polygon where you basically it's like a histogram, but it's kind of with a line plot where, the, where the, the markers are the center of the box and they're connected by straight lines that actually they're smoother and are thought to give better representations of continuous data. Um, so when you do this, you'll know what your data looks like and you might find out really interesting, interesting things like, wow, this data is bimodal. There are two populations here. I mean, something's going on or like this isn't the right test to use. Now, if you um, do find out that's the case, there are a few things you can do. One is you can apply normalizing transformations, like log of x might be normally distributed, okay? Like that'd be like a log normal distribution. Another is that you might wanna use a different statistic. Like I said, you know, um, first of all, it's bimodal, you wanna reanalyze your data, but if it's, let's say, has a, a, a skewed distribution, you know, a lot of your non-parametric methods are okay, we're fine with skewed distributions, I'm assuming they make certain assumptions. Um, so, and I'd say the key here is to um, understand uh, what the limitations of your statistical test are. So when you're gonna apply, let's say a student's t-test, you know, go to some stats textbook and look up what are the assumptions that are being made. And if those assumptions are not being met, you, you should need to do another test, okay? Um, and in general, your non-parametric tests are very forgiving. Um, relative to your parametric test, they make less assumptions and they tend to be applicable in a wider variety of instances. And your, like I said, your Wilcoxon tests, they're pretty easy. I mean, they're really easy to apply. They're not that complicated. And they're applicable in a lot of instances where your, uh, like your student's t-test and some of your other parametric tests are not valid. Finally, incorrect interpretation. Now, this is a really complicated topic and this is probably where you've seen a lot of stuff in the literature. Um, talking about how 
um, you know, like how people misinterpret the results and stuff. And there are many, many different ways in which you can misinterpret your results. I mean, that's, that, that would be something you couldn't get through in a day of, uh, of lectures on statistics. But I'm going to talk about the one single one that bugs me the most, okay? And I see this done all the time. You see it in published data, um, data published in pretty good journals. It's multiple comparisons are not accounted for, okay? So when you've got a p-value, that's the p-value of a single test, a single observation being greater than a certain threshold. What happens if there are multiple tests, okay? Now imagine you're looking at a bunch of antineoplastic medications and each one, um, you know, and you have a p-value of 0 0.5, okay? That's basically a probability of 1 in 20 that it's going to be positive, assuming the null hypothesis is true. But let's say you've got 20 tests. So you've got a probability of 1 in 20 it's going to happen. You've got 20 tests. What happens then? So I generated uh, 20 different normal distributions, mean 0, variance 1, and applied the student's t-test. And lo and behold, two of them were positive. And this is no surprise, right? The expected number of positive results in this case is 1. Now, I'm sure you see why that's a problem. You've got, you want a p-value of 0 0.05, and your expected number of positives in this ensemble of tests is 1. So the reason for that is that you're conducting this test multiple times, each of which at a p-value of 0 0.05. Now, there are many potential solutions to dealing with multiple comparisons. Um, some of them are really complicated. I think the easiest one is the Bonferroni correction. You guys might have heard about this before. It's very conservative, works on just about pretty much any test you're going to do. Might overcorrect a little bit, but that's, you know, uh, I think a little better than undercorrecting. And basically what you do is you divide the, the threshold you want by the number of tests. So basically you take your p-value of 0 0.05 and divide that by 20, and this gives you the uh, probability, uh, the uh, type 1 error value to use for each test that will give you a type, uh, a 0 0.05 type 1 error value for the whole ensemble of, of 20 tests, okay? And so basically if we use this new statistical, this new threshold here, you'll note that none of the uh, p-values are statistically significant, um, you know, using this Bonferroni corrected p-value, which is what, you, what you'd want and expect to occur. Um, and uh, just actually, this, this actually makes me think of uh, one other p-value I do have when I see people doing statistics, they'll say, you know, so statistics, uh, you know, this was statistically significant at the 0 0.05 level, right? Well, you can't Bonferroni correct that. If somebody actually gives you their p-value, you can apply a Bonferroni correction you want to. You can use a different threshold if you want to. So when you're presenting your data, don't just say it was statistically significant, okay? I would always say explicitly give the p-value, unless it's something ridiculous like, you know, less than 0 0.00001. I mean, at that point, yeah, you, know, you just say less than 0 0.0001. But beyond that, I would really encourage people to explicitly give their p-values. So um, these are, like I said, uh, a uh, summary of the errors that uh, you know, I'd say uh, your new investigators may make, and maybe sometimes some more experienced investigators as well, but less so. Um, some potential solutions we discussed. And um, I really think that this is the, the really hard part. I think the things I showed today were a little bit easier. The last part of understanding the your statistical results and what inferences you can make is much harder. For that, you need a much better grasp of the statistics. That's not something you can quickly fix. And for that, there are a bunch of neat statistical resources I identified that um, the top one is just like, you know, some silly mistakes people make that can cause them to waste some time. Um, but really, you know, like I said, are usually caught a little bit earlier on in the analysis. Um, I really like this one here, how to upset the statistical referee. That's a, that's a pretty fun one. Statistics done wrong. That's a book um, which talks a lot about some of the statistical mistakes you, you can make. Um, and of course, I'm sure many of you have heard of this article right here, um, why most published results are false. Um, and like so these kind of get into a bit of the higher level um, ideas about what statistical inferences you can make and what statements you can say. Um, and a nice little textbook that's freely available online is this one right here, Review Some Basic Probability and Statistics. Okay, and I, we're holding questions for the end, so thank you for your time. Andrew Rosenkranz will be our next speaker. Preparing the manuscript. Right, th thank you for the invitation to speak and thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, so, uh, so actually, so if approaching the topic of um, preparing a manuscript and what you can most do for uh, success in getting it published and getting it out there. So I think uh, this all starts well before when you sit down to write that paper, but 
way back the initial uh, planning stages of the project. So you really need to set yourself up for success. So the proper planning and conduct of the study will make your life much easier when you later go to write the paper. So if there's some fundamental flaw, there's nothing you can do to really fix that just by clever writing when you go to actually write the paper. So you're gonna have to anticipate the weaknesses and the limitations from the outset of the study. So that sounds all good and well, you know, kind of obvious. So you know, what are ways we can try to approach this? So I think actually getting things down on paper can help tremendously and make all the difference versus when you just have it, the idea in your head. So I think at the very beginning of the project and when you're thinking about it, you know, put it, write it down, make an outline of what that paper might look like once it's all written, even, if, even though you haven't started yet, even though you don't have any of your data. Share, you can even share with your colleagues, try to brainstorm it, think of what will be the criticism, but write down what are the limitations, how will this be attacked when I put it out there in the public domain. And I think um, those potential criticisms can become more obvious once you uh, go through those steps of getting it uh, written down, getting outside the input, and then continue to go through that process, uh, continue to revisit it um, as you work on this. And then over time, you're in essence almost developing your manuscript draft or outline as, as you're uh, working on the project. So here's where I think a degree of paranoia can be really helpful. So there's some big obvious flaw. It's not just kind of like magically disappear while you work on the project. Just the more the, the time goes by, the, the more that'll stay an issue. So you really just need to try to really address, I think, the major flaws up front uh, when it's so early in the process and before you've invested too much time in it. Uh, so I think this might be one of the most Im uh, important slides or points I could make uh, in terms of getting your paper published is just to ask a really important question. I mean, sometimes we might have done the, the perfect study, the most robust methodology, pristine, no, no flaw, but it's who cares, it makes no difference. And again, you're gonna run into challenges when you go to, uh, um, we'll write it up. So you know, there's nothing you need to save the project if it just doesn't make any difference. And I think it'll gain more leeway with reviewers and journals if something is really high impact. I think an editor will recognize that this is a high impact study. It's gonna gain a lot of traction. They'll wanna publish it. And they might be a little more accepting. There's some flaw, which they say, well, maybe you had to have that flaw, but it's just a really important topic. And just an example, I, I think what I believe has been the most, the longest continuously funded study in the US, the Framingham Start Heart Study, has looked at really important questions, the impact of diet, exercise, smoking, blood pressure control, and heart disease. Uh, and th this has been funded for an enormous period. And just, I, I think the, this is the level we can think of. I think the uh, higher the level of the study, the, the more uh, worthwhile it would be uh, at the end. Uh, so now, uh, in terms of the actual project, so defining the study stope, scope, uh, we want here a clearly defined and focused question. All aspects of the study should be defensible. And I think uh, here there's a risk of being overly ambitious or having scope creep, and we'll have our team together, and everybody will throw in how they want to approach the question. There's the all types of things we can do or that would be interesting, but we risk taking on so many aims that we don't do any of them well. And I think you're better off having it be more uh, focus, but every aspect of the study we can, def it'll only be as strong as the weakest link. Maybe we had three or four questions and all of them were really strong, but there was one weak question, that's where the reviewers will jump on. So I think we have to uh, be very uh, clear here as to what our question is from the beginning. Right, so then as we're moving along, we're going to create our study sample, so we should be crystal clear in what our reference is and be prepared to justify it. Let's say we're going to say we're going to have uh, um, you know, whether it's, it's something based on pathology or clinical follow-up, uh, surgery, you should have some reason. Particularly if, say, you're mixing different data sources. You're gonna say, well, the malignant lesions have pathology, the benign ones don't get operated on, so they're gonna be cl just cl clinical follow-up, and it starts to get a little muddled. You're gonna have some reasons to give for that in the methods. And there's gonna be trade-offs. So I, I think one thing that can be helpful is to actually know the literature on the topic well, know what the inclusion and exclusion criteria are for the relevant earlier studies, and you could say, well, we have this this exclusion criteria consistent with these four other earlier studies on the topic. And that makes it much more difficult for a reviewer to criticize. Now they'd be basically taking on all those earlier studies as well. Uh, be consistent. Uh, you know, don't, don't say we're gonna have these 20 patients uh, based on our inclusion criteria, and there was these two other patients that we really wanted to put in the study and they didn't quite fit, but we just put them in anyway. You, know, you really have to be consistent and be rigorous in keeping track of the reasons for in inclusions and exclusions as you go. That could later be requested by reviewers. I think there'd be nothing more painful than, say, going through a database of 2,000 patients. You find 80 of them in your project. You didn't keep track of why you threw a bunch of them out. And then you later realize you need that to go through them all again. Uh, so you're going to have a data collection form. 
This is a critical aspect of the study. It's going to ultimately define your data and key findings. I, I think Bill brought up this point. You want to anticipate your full range of measures to be assessed from the outset and only go through the cases once. Let's say this is a chart review or image review. It could be impractical if not introduced bias to ask readers to go back and repeat their readings for additional measures. Say the readers, you know, they really read 100 MRs retrospectively, they get a bunch of features, and then you realize, oh, there's another feature they should have gotten, let's have them go back again. Well, it might not be, uh, 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 it might be now a little com contaminated versus that they did all that from the beginning. Um, so you're gonna wanna rigorously pilot that data collection form before the readers get it underway and actually have readers test it out with cases and make sure it's getting all the information that you want. In terms of picking your readers, they'll typically have multiple readers, uh, especially for things with subjective measures. You consider the target journals. Some journals, will, uh, some of the more competitive journals will usually want higher numbers of readers, say three or more. Uh, you have the readers have a range of experiences, uh, more junior and senior readers. So maybe you'll show their observations robust against uh, across a range of experience or not. Those readers should not be involved in the initial case selection or reference or determination. I've seen that too where say so that uh, somebody reviewed a database of cases uh, and, they, and they identify the case and they knew which ones were positive, which were the negative, and then that same reader went, person went through and read, reviewed the MRs in the cases. Well, they're going to know now what the outcomes were. I think it can be helpful to do a reader training session uh, where, say, maybe the readers review a set of cases that were not in the study, um, and then they meet and they go over their readings and they discuss them, and they'll bring out the areas of discrepancy, and I think that can really help improve inter-reader agreement. Maybe there was just some feature they were interpreting differently, but once you bring some light to it, they can quickly get on the same page. Uh, so now for drafting the manuscript. So reviewers, editors, and the readers are going to expect a certain structure. This should be a scientific investigation focused on the research at hand. It's not a review of the topic. This isn't a platform to express your personal views on the current state of affairs. It should all be driven by the data that you obtain. So to go through the pieces, the introduction, this should avoid textbook information. There's really two things you want to do, define a problem and then state how you're going to solve it. Uh, indicate why it's important, make sure you introduce the key pieces of the study, and I think this should end with a clear statement or purpose of hypothesis that should lead directly what, from the rest of your introduction. I would say here that it should almost be like a cover test when, say when you write multiple choice questions. If you cover up the purpose statement in the end, somebody read in the introduction, they should kind of predict what that purpose will be. And I've seen times where they didn't seem to match at all, where say the introduction uh, was talking about, you know, so I do prostate MR, the introduction is describing how great prostate MR is. And then in the purpose, they'll say they want to look at the value of diffusion. But they haven't mentioned that anywhere in the introduction. Well, I'm like, well, that doesn't really lead into it. It, 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 should, all, it should all fit on, a, on the same theme. Methods, uh, so we'll have a sort of section, subjects, imaging protocol, image evaluation, reference standard, and statistics. Uh, typically, the methods will include a flow chart of the explicit inclusions and exclusions. Radiology typically requires that, your figure one. Uh, you should indicate who did which tasks beyond even, say, the image review. So if somebody did a, a chart review, uh, reviewed the, the EHR, you should indicate who did that and what their role was. And be sure to cover all the later results that you provide, especially being cognizant of qualitative or post hoc observations. Um, say some, some, not all the data that was quantitative, it's easy to forget to mention that in the methods. Uh, so, this, uh, so these details are, are important. You want to avoid the trap that happened to this paper. I'm not quite sure how this made it past the reviewers and editors and copy editors and authors, but the results in this study, we have used insert statistical method here to com hopefully they, people will proofread enough to uh, avoid that from happening. So uh, results, uh, this should have a consistent and organized structure. Um, list results in a parallel fashion, fashion for various modalities and sequences. So if you're giving results for T1 and T2, the uh, way to think of it, give the, give, give, make your point for both of them. Or if patients underwent CT and MRI, make your points for both. Uh, not just say CT had excellent performance, not stated for MRI. Otherwise, your reader, the review, reader might be wondering, what are you hiding? Like, why are you only giving some results but not everything? Uh, that should follow the same order you established in the methods. Um, and there should really be a synergy between the text and the tables and figures, avoiding redundancy, and really using the text to highlight the key findings that are in the tables. Um, so just a couple of, so Bill gave his pet peeves in the last talk. Maybe I'll give some mine. So, um, Sometimes giving the p-values without actual data. So just saying T2 signal intensity was significantly different between the benign and malignant lesions. So that's 
p-values the confidence that the result is significant, but it's not the result itself. Right? It doesn't give us any a sense of the effect size. Maybe it was a minimal difference or a large difference. It even, this wording wasn't even tell us which the benign or malignant had the higher T2 signal intensity. It just tells us that there was some difference that we're confident was there, but we don't actually know what it was. Uh, another one, uh, differentiating, I think, results from a discussion or an interpretation of the data. You may see feature X was an excellent predictor of outcome Y. That's not, to me, a direct observation. That's an interpretation. What was that definition of excellent? Could somebody else have looked at that same data, the same result, and not be, suppose there was the uh, accuracy was 75%. Is that excellent? Is that just good? I, I guess it depends on the context and uh, how good the standard test does. Um, so again, just these descriptions that giving actual data and numbers um, is, I, I think, an easy pitfall. So the discussion, I, I view this as five key things we want to get across. Uh, a plain text summary of our key findings, a comparison with the existing literature, the implications or how this will impact our practice, limitations, and then a brief conclusion. So uh, the same point I made a number of times, be sure to remain focused on the data at hand Avoid a lengthy discussion, all of which could have been written even had the study never been done. So I've encountered that sometimes, say if I'm reviewing a paper where the discussion is all really good, like it's really interesting, this is, you could have never done the project and written all, all of that. Um, so this isn't a platform for advancing your personal agenda on the topic. And then again, make sure the implications are clear and answer the so what question, because that could easily be something a reviewer could jump on. They could, maybe they didn't really see any flaws in your methodology, but they just don't see the impact. Um, a proper literature review is important to avoid missing a clearly relevant earlier study. Don't be overly dismissive of earlier papers. I know sometimes we're thinking, well, we want to show how, much, how we're so much better in, how, in our methods, but your reviewer maybe wrote that earlier paper and you start trashing it. So you want to be careful. Tactfully point out differences in methodology and results between yours and the earlier studies just to make clear the novelty of your own work. Avoid overstating the importance of the work. You know, if appropriate, indicate the need for larger studies, the need for further validation. Avoid recommending whole scale changes in clinical practice based on initial small pilot studies. So say I'm reading an article and they had a retrospective single center study of 25 patients with one reader, you know, saying therefore we should change how we interpret. Well, no, like you need, you need follow-up studies. So uh, try to have some, I think, level of humility ab about, uh, about your study. Figures. Um, the findings and image, the images should match the claims made uh, in, the, in the legends. Um, some of this sounds obvious, but, I, I, but it'll, it'll happen. Sometimes I've looked at the legend and looked at the figure, I'm like, I just don't, you know, just don't see it. Uh, so it should support the paper's key findings. It should be clearly annotated, and then should have a reasonable number of uh, images. The abstract, so, so this is crucial. Many readers will not see any elements of the manuscript beyond the abstract. The abstract may be their only interaction with your work. Uh, if you think of this area on PubMed, where it's, so you know, we can easily, within seconds, get abstracts, but it'd be more work to get the actual article, which may be behind some type of a paywall or restricted. So the abstract can become the public's overall awareness of your whole study. So here's where I think even every single word, you know, consider, and there should be some, uh, and, 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 to, and to really uh, optimize, um, optimize it from beginning to end. Uh, and this needs to be able to stand on its own without the rest of the paper. And I've seen this too where uh, there's some, so the most journals have about 250 word abstract limit. So there's say some data or some results that's in your paper but that doesn't make it into the abstract. But then the conclusion of the abstract, you would only get there if you had the whole paper. So that's uh, uh, also not preferred. So this really needs to be a self-contained um, snapshot. Uh, authorship issues, uh, unfortunately these come up all too often. Um, but but it, it's an important thing, and, and, so, and it's always it's, you know it's, it's always a struggle. And we probably all had issues with this at our own institutions. Um, so this, this ideally should be addressed with contributors up front as individuals join this study, and it should really reflect the specific and substantive contributions to the study at hand. That's really all it should be. It shouldn't be, uh, well, this person going up for promotion and they really need it, so let's move them up in the author order or they went early in the author order in the last study, so now let's move them back in this one. It, it really should be what were their contributions to, uh, this, to this project. Um, often it's gonna be the project leader who's gonna establish that order, reflecting uh, relative contributions. 
And so, sometimes it will involve honest and open discussions among the co-investigators, and that's not always uh, so easy, and these can be tough conversations when they come up, you have to have them. Uh, in terms of selecting a journal, uh, so you should become familiar with the content and style of your target journal, go over to the table of contents of recent, recent issues, look at articles, uh, see what they usually publish, and you may even tailor your manuscript draft to fit the journal. And, and you can take this to different, different levels. Different journals will tend to have, say, different length of the intro or methods. Do these tend to be short or long? Some journals tend to have more of an active voice or passive voice, and, and you can really try to get it to fit the style. Uh, be aware of the journal's unique requirements and guidelines for each element, abstract tables, figures, uh, um, references. Uh, review the journal website carefully, because otherwise this could be a source of the office just bouncing it back to you and introducing um, some undesired uh, delays and turnaround. Uh, before you submit, it's, it's often helpful to uh, ask someone not involved in the project to read over the paper and to get further outside perspective. And when you do this, uh, you know, ask them to be brutally honest and then don't be overly sensitive or defensive to their feedback or else they won't be honest with you again. Um, and, then, and during the final review before submission, uh, again, just be honest with yourself. If there's some, like sometimes you just know there's some obvious limitation, but you're, you know, we're all excited, you work so hard on this and you're just so eager to turn it. The readers are gonna pick up on some clear weakness that could be readily addressed. So just, you, you're, you're not gonna be able to escape and it'll come back to you and it's always easier to, again, to deal with these issues up front and just sometimes you just slow yourself down or take a little bit extra time and fix something before you turn it in. It could save, save you higher orders of magnitude more work later uh, down the road. Uh, so then you turn it in, you wait and you wait and then uh, you uh, have this whole revision process which we've come to uh, know and love. So uh, with revisions, try to be as responsive as possible. Make all the edits that you can that will give you some leverage for those that you, that you state can't be done. When you just can't do what the reviewers say, try to justify beyond just saying, oh, unfortunately we can't do that or be time consuming or tedious, um, which can come across as, well, you know, we just, we just don't want to bother or, or you know, we don't think it's important to do that. So if you can come up with some scientific rationale, even if you, it's kind of like a theme I made earlier, if you can say, well, what we did was consistent with the earlier methods of these other authors, and we were just following an established precedent. Because then it's really then the reviewers now have to kind of take on those other authors as well. And, and maintain humility, avoid arguing with the reviewers, and, and again, just try to uh, be respectful and do uh, what you can. And, and you, if the journal is asking you to make revisions, it's, they have some uh, level of interest in the work. And, and you, usually if you try to put a good faith effort, uh, you, you can uh, um, get, get past this stage. So just some closing thoughts, uh, much of, and this is kind of the themes I've been stressing. So frequently seek input from others uh, from the beginning of the project. It's unlikely you're gonna get things just right from the start. You wanna avoid becoming too locked in on your original plan. When I think back to some of the papers I've had, I feel I've got the, maybe had the biggest impact in terms of citations or attention or even later publications. They were totally different from our original idea or concept. And somewhere along the way, we kind of switched course and I think that's what allowed us to um, kind of get to our uh, final product. Uh, maintain a thick skin um, as you do this. Um, try to learn from each submission and continually improve with later studies and manuscripts. And, uh, um, and this is something where I think experience will uh, help a lot. Uh, so hopefully that was, that was helpful and um, we'll be up here for questions, thanks. I actually have a question. Um, in terms of inspiration, can both of you discuss where you get your ideas from for your studies? Most of this, my ideas come from my everyday work and you know things like, wow, I've got a question about that or something I notice. So I, it comes from the stuff I do every day, usually. I agree. Uh, you know what you do every day, and then also just I think. Um, if, you, if you're, say, reading a study and there's a, if you're reading an article that's published and there's some limitation or challenge or you're in their conclusion, they're saying, well, future studies are wanting to do blank or in the limitation section, they're saying a limitation of this was blank. That could maybe kind of be a, an, you know, the, the beginning of an idea or a thought. You kind of see the gaps in the current literature on the topic. 
And also think going to uh, tumor boards or multidisciplinary co uh, conferences, you can are really can, can be a really good source of collaboration ideas. Seeing what the challenges are that our referrers have, and it might be something that we don't, totally don't even appreciate. And then it's some question that's really important to them. So I think you learn uh, interesting angles uh, that way too. Uh, question for the audience. Um, how many here are residents? And how many here are junior attendings just starting out looking to get involved in research? And how many from departments 20 or smaller, 20 faculty or smaller? So about a handful, okay. Any questions from the audience? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that, that's your, I mean, that's basically your story, right? Though, though that's what you're writing about. Um, so, I mean, the intro method results in the discussion all have to jive. So I completely agree with that. Okay, well, thank you very much.